Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar. I can see people are still coming but we do like to start on time. So I want to welcome everybody who has signed up today and we are recording this event so everybody that is watching it later on welcome as well. Um, we've had over 120 signups of students, alumni and guests so we're, we're really excited to host this event this evening. And I wanna thank the Marketing Alumni Network who have uh, organized this in their own time as volunteers. And we really, really appreciate them organizing this for us. And we would like to do a quick shout out that we are actually looking for one more member for the committee of this amazing event organization uh, because one of our members is going on maternity leave. Um, so at the end, we'll have a link to our LinkedIn group and also an email address to find out a bit more about that role if that's something that you might be interested in. So without further ado, oh, I will just say this, if you do have any questions for the speakers, which I hope that you do, please, please, can you put them in the Q&A section of the Zoom as opposed to the chat? Um, we would love as many questions as possible and you can ask them the whole time and we will ask them at the end. The more questions, the better. So I am now going to hand over to Elodie, who is the chair for this afternoon evening, and she is going to introduce our amazing speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hazel. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. And welcome to this exciting fireside chat uh, on the topic uh, that's going to be both inspiring and informative, the path to Chief Marketing Officer. I am Elodie Levasseur, your host for tonight. I'm an ex-international marketing director, and I'm now a leadership coach. And I'm thrilled to be with you on this engaging conversation today. So today we'll be exploring the highs, the lows, and everything in between as we uncover those strategies, the mindset, the resilience it takes to ascend to the role of chief, mar chief marketing officer. So whether you're a business school student uh, aspiring to become a marketing leader or a professional seeking to enhance your skills and inside this fireside chat promises to be really illuminating for you and to get you through the world of marketing leadership. So we, as Hazel said, please, you know, we actively engage, uh, encourage you to be active in the conversation. So feel free to submit your question in the Q&A uh, and I'll try to incorporate them either into the discussion or after in the Q&A. So now I have the pleasure to introduce um, two remarkable guests today um, who have actually navigated the dynamic work of marketing to reach the pinnacle of their career. So please join us in extending a warm welcome to Virginie Faucon, who is a former CMO of BBC Maestro, and Adam Boita, uh, who is a CMO of Ecology. So thank you both for joining today. Hello. <laughs> Fabulous. And it's great. So to start, I would love you to give us a bit of maybe a top line overview of your career to date, you know, like what is, you know, what what has been the highlights, your achievement to get to where you are now today? So could we start maybe with um, with with you, Virginie, if that's OK? Yes, of course. No problem at all. Um, and thank you. Thank you for 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 having me. And, and uh, hello, Elodie and, and Adam. Um, so, um, I mean, highlights of my career, my, my current role, I'll start with that. So I'm currently a uh, customer marketing director for a company called Bally's Interactive, which is formerly known as Gamesys. Um, that's quite a recent role. Um, previously to that, I was a uh, CMO at uh, BBC Maestro and, uh, uh, before that I was the CMO for a company called Climate. Um, and I suppose I've been in marketing for about 20 years. I uh, started my career um, as, a, as a business consultant um, uh, in the technology te telco space. Uh, did that for a couple of years, didn't particularly enjoy it and decided to go client side. And then worked for quite a few years for really large brands in the um in the telco media media sector, um, so the likes of Sky, News UK, O2, EE, um, and uh, sort of did really kind of learned the ropes, I suppose, through through the, doing that for for about fifteen years, and then got to a point in my career where I decided to move 
and pivot and and um, and work for smaller businesses and startups uh, scale ups in the last five six years. Uh, that's where my predominantly my my focus has been, and that's how I I kind of grew to become uh, to become CMO. That's where I am today. So worked in the financial sector actually for the last five six years up until recently where I've changed sectors again so that's just a bit of a highlight um I suppose of my career hopefully that's that's uh that's a good a good sort of summary um yes and yeah, think... uh, I'll pass on over to yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Thank you, Virginie. That's great. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Adam, yeah, can you tell us, you know, how you started your career marketing career in the first place? And yeah, sure. Um, so I started my career at PlayStation as a junior product manager, but I didn't land that role just like out of the blue. I was actually uh, working for a temp agency, um, doing press press cuttings in the in the PR department. Um, and then I was the, I was worked in the post room for another like three months. Uh, but I got to know everyone at PlayStation. And then when, um, uh, an opening came up for a junior product manager role, you know, I, I used my degree, which was in advertising and marketing and everything I'd learned there to, 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 to kind of land that kind of first role. So I was at PlayStation for about seven years, <clears throat> um, started off as a junior product manager, uh, and then worked my way up to become marketing manager of the UK office. Uh, where we launched brands like PlayStation Portable, if people remember that, PlayStation 3 and, and PlayStation Network, which was the kind of start of uh, network gaming and kind of downloadable content. Uh, and then I swapped the world of gaming for the world of um, cocktails and drinks, uh, working at Piano Ricard uh, for, again, seven years. So must be a seven-year itch in terms of those two to. Uh, Two, two, two stints, uh, and I worked across uh, many global brands in the UK office for Absolute Vodka, um, Jameson Whiskey, Beef Eater Gin, um, the Tequila Portfolio. Pretty much worked across everything apart from uh, Scotch Whiskey and Champagnes and Wines, uh, and ended my kind of tenure there as head of marketing for, for Lifestyle Spirits. Um, and then I swapped the, the world of drinks and, and cocktails for... Uh, a very different um, different pursuit and purpose to work for NCS, which for people who don't know is the National Citizen Service, which is one of the largest kind of youth programs in the UK, um, set up as part of David Cameron's Big Society originally. Um, but we had like over 600,000 um, 16 and 17 year olds go through the program over the space of 10 years. Uh, and my kind of tenure there was for, for, the, for, for the last three, as it were, um, where we kind of re- <clears throat> refreshed the brand, made it more applicable to Gen Z, and just gave it an overall overall facelift. And that so that was that was super fun. And then uh, it, it came. Uh, I guess my current role at Ecology came about. So I, I was brand director at NCS, and then my current role at NCS came about through an, an old connection at PlayStation, who wanted me to mentor um, a head of marketing in his new sustainable startup. Uh, I did that, and then um, that came became a bit of a consultancy gig on the side, and then that eventually led me to to working at Ecology as, as their kind of full time CMO. Um, so I guess to conclude, my kind of red thread was like entertaining a generation, then making them happy, getting them drunk maybe, yeah. uh, then trying to make them more resilient in the world of in the world that they're going to go into, and try and teach them the skills that um, you don't necessarily learn in the classroom. And I guess the kind of latest pursuit is hopefully protecting the planet that they will inherit. So, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that, Adam, as well. Yeah. And thank you both, because as we can see, you know, the, the, the path to CMO is not as always a straight line or a straightforward trajectory. You know, you both have different uh, industry background as well. So it's really interesting as well to see that the, 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 the marketing leadership can be applied in different industry. And so it doesn't stop you from moving to one industry to another industry. And I can tell I can same for myself as well when as you know, uh, music industry, um, uh, hospitality. Uh, so it's the same thing. You just apply different skills to 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 different industry the hardest thing i found is you have to learn all the vocabulary at the beginning when you're starting 
on that industry. So I think the first six months is always a bit tough. <laughs> um, but I'd love to ask you, you know, wh why do you think that is? Like to have that path to CMO that's not a straight line. And what do you think that, you know, it has to be with what what does qualify the role of CMO really? Like because of that nonlinear trajectory, how do we get to a role of CMO? Like what what could take us there? Or... Do you want to go first, Vision? Oh, I was going to ask you, say, Adam, how about you go first? I okay. went first. <laughs> um, yeah, I think what was really interesting, but you know, I never thought, oh, I want to become a CMO. And I remember thinking when I was a junior product manager, thinking that a marketing manager looks scary. And then when I was a marketing manager, thinking a marketing director as a role looks scary. And then as a brand director, thinking, God, CMO would be super scary. And yet here I am doing doing the role. So <clears throat> uh, I didn't set out to do it do it initially, but I knew I always wanted to be passionate about what I, what I did uh, and, 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 and try and fit a job that suited my lifestyle and, and, and my life stage at that particular point in time. Um, and a very, I remember a really distinct conversation with a, um, a you know, recruitment um, consultant when I was at PlayStation and I was thinking of getting into FMCG. And uh, they straight up told me, oh, you know, you know, you're not an FMCG marketeer. You're an entertainment marketeer and you'll never break into FMCG. And I remember thinking at the time, I, I, but I don't want to be in gaming forever. I don't want to just jump, I, you know, lots of people. And that's fine if you want to be in gaming forever, right? Lots of my peers went from PlayStation, then they jumped to Sega, then they went to Nintendo, they went to Microsoft. And it just became the kind of same merry-go-round, but just doing it in a different company in the same industry. And so I was always very much, uh, I didn't want to be boxed in as a, gaming marketeer i always wanted to make that that leap into other categories uh and so it was great that when i did want to change actually lots of industries were suddenly starting to wake up and saying well what happens if i could borrow a marketeer from say nike and put them into or you know or playstation and put them into a drinks brand like what would that what would that kind of combination come together and, and could that drive more innovation for our brand rather than just a traditional person that's come from a, another drinks industry. So I was quite lucky that I was on the cusp of that and, and that's the direction I wanted to take. And then the industry allowed that to happen and that became a little bit of a trend. As my dad says, the trend is your friend, so try and stick with it. Um, so I think that's kind of why I felt that I had a bit of a non-linear path. It was just like, Okay, I really love drinks. Can I get into that? Okay, now in my lifestyle, I've got I've got two kids. I really want to be able to give back to society. Okay, NCS fits with that kind of piece. And then obviously thinking about more sustainability into climate is kind of where I where I've got to, gotten to now. So I've always been led by what I've wanted, what I've been interested in, which has resulted in that more disjointed or or different industry to different industry path to to kind of where I am where I am now. So I, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't going to be a stickler for the status quo and, and stay within my within within my industry. And it was the same with same with the booze and same with um with with government and kind of civil society. So uh, I'll hand over to Virginia on <laughs> her, her perspective. I mean, I I I think this was really that's why I said to go first because I I um I quite like listening to others' perspectives sometimes and. Uh, bouncing off that. Um, it gives me lots of ideas I hadn't even thought about. So <laughs> it's actually fascinating to listen uh, to you, Adam. It reminds me of things that I hadn't even thought about when I was sort of preparing for, for this event. Um, I was told the same. <laughs> I, was, I was told um, I would never break into FMCG. I actually didn't in the end. But I was kind of told the same early on in my career that there was, I mean, the, we're talking 20 years ago. I think things, things have changed a little bit. Things are more squiggly. I mean, we all know squiggly careers quite a popular term concept and I know the founders very well because there's the marketing academy with them um, but back in the days when I started in marketing it was still very much the era of your career path is sort of sort of led, led in front of you so if you start a product manager in FMCG that's what you'll do and you'll kind of grow, grow the ranks there but um, if you start in gaming, you'll do gaming. And so I was told the same. So it reminded me of these conversations, fascinated at the start as a junior marketeer, you know, you've you've stumbled in telco, you're therefore going to do telco all your life. Um, and 
and thinking at the time, I don't really know where I want to go, but I'm not sure that's what I want to do. Um, that I, I I want to just go on, and I, and I did for a while. I, I I tend to joke and say I did the lotto, you know, I did EE, then O2, and I was joking. I'll do all of them, you know, I'll do the full cards. But then that, that's where you know at some point I thought, well, no, because I need to, I need to pursue. I need to build my career. I need to become an actor of my career. And and for me, I, like you, Adam, I agree. I, I never set out to go, it's going to have to be CMO. It was really almost all, exactly what you described. It was always, oh, the next level sounds quite scary. Oh, the next level. And I was just looking at the next level. And that was already big enough for a while, for a few years. I didn't go, oh, I want to go there. And I'm obsessed with that. But what I did know is that after a while, Probably the first sort of 10 years, I was just going, you know, I said going around maybe the industry, just trying to kind of build a career and learn marketing. And then got to a point where I, was st I started thinking, I know enough with a head off level. I now need to be a, more of an actor. So I'm going to go and pursue, um, you know, roles where I feel I'm going to be learning new things and be, being pushed outside of my comfort zone and it's going to sound it might, some of them might look scary and I might take some risks and they might not pay off and I know we'll talk about failures some of them failed and uh, but it'll be exciting and also I feel it will really help me grow and it did really accelerate from my from my side at least that's the thing that was a catalyst is that when I started at the head off level after probably 10-15 years I started really actively going out for different industries, different roles, smaller businesses, and just putting outside of my comfort zone, it did really accelerate things a little bit for me because I was learning quite a lot of new things and I was building uh, a, a broader profile quite quickly. Um, and I did find that sometimes that meant having to, to step away from a business um, and go and look for something and, and be quite, uh, yeah, take that control so that I was able to kind of forcing the fate, I suppose. Otherwise, I could have waited another 10 years for the promotion. And, and that's maybe the bit I didn't do is that at some point I decided I'm not going to, but they said not exactly, you say nothing wrong. And I, my, my husband, in fact, and others do do spend quite a long time in, in businesses and look for opportunities within and we'll wait and we'll be more patient and grow. I think I got, I'm a bit impatient. So I got to a point where, because I'm quite impatient, I also decided that wasn't for me. So um, that hence the squiggliness of, well, I went for this and then that, and then I tried something else. But then I, in doing that, it was quite hard. I failed a lot. And there were lots of moments of doubts, but I did also, when it worked, it did also accelerate things because I wasn't waiting. <laughs> I was going for the roles. So that's a little bit how I kind of, kind of built that path. But a little bit, as I said, by chance and design, really, um, it was certainly not linear at all. Um, yeah, that that's probably my my perspective. Yeah, thank you. I wouldn't recommend it for everyone. I'm not sure as this is uh, the way only, but <laughs> I think I think just way. just uh, just on one one point there. I think you know changing jobs is always difficult, right? But changing jobs in a into a different industry is a double compound yes because if you you know i could have gone from marketing manager of playstation to marketing manager in say microsoft xbox and i already know the industry i already know the games and it's just applying the same business problem to that industry so you're already like a shoe in but suddenly going from playstation to Pernod Ricard, where it's more corporate uh suddenly i'm managing like a 40 million pound p l and you can't spend it until you've earned it and uh, you're looking at inputs like the on trade, the off trade, the impulse sector that, I mean, like you say, you, every single leap I've done because it's been that different industry and a step up in terms of role, there have been huge doubts about can yeah. I do this? But that first six months, I mean, you grow so much and then you look back and think, oh, my God, I've achieved so much in such a short space of time. And then that gives you the momentum to then you know, obviously continue in that role. Mm. I love it. Yes, yeah, thank you both for that. This is this is really good, like talking about pushing yourself outside your comfort zone, right? You know, even if you fail and even if you have doubts, you know that there is growth on the other side. And actually talking about that kind of mindset, right? Actually, what mindset do you believe that has been most instrumental for you in your journey to become a CMO? Do you want me to go first? Yeah, go Can we do a rotation? 
to, to make you, so it's yeah, not always it. me trying to steal your ideas. <laughs> it's just easier to go second because you go, yes, same as you said, everything the same. Um, um, so it's a it's a very interesting question. I was it was sort of thinking for a minute. Um, I mean, I suppose mindset, um, I mean, just kind of touching because we obviously what we've just said, this is, this is a conversation and it flows. Um, I, you know, I suppose um, if we're talking purely mindset uh, and, and it's hard because I don't want it to come across as, oh, if, if I don't have this mindset or I don't have these particular qualities, then I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm never going to be able to progress because I, I don't think that's that's right. But for me, think of what we just talked about. Certainly, I know that. Um, there's certain being one, uh, and we will talk about it even more. I know it, it, the curiosity. So um, I do. I do think that, and it probably came over time. I now because I've changed industries a lot. So I went from telco media. Well, I went telco, then I newspapers, then I went to Sky, and then I decided, well, let's go crazy and let's go to insurance, which had nothing to do with anything. And people keep questioning to this day. It's like, how would you even? How does it even work? And but then the thing is, by doing that, and then I've done it again, and I'm. I'm not quite excited like I'm really quite curious I, I to approach a new job a new industry with really that that the kind of thirst of like oh you know it's going to be nice I'll learn something new it's going to be different so it, it, I think that really helped the mindset of it's less daunting over the years because I've got used to it um, and and it's actually quite exhilarating, exciting. It'll be new. I won't be. It won't be comfortable, but I'll learn some new stuff. And that I think for me has been quite an important mindset. And wanting to continually learn and 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 learn co constantly and new things. Um, the other thing, obviously, we talked about is that it is very hard at times, and you do doubt, and you have massive failures as well. It's not just doubt; sometimes it doesn't work. So there is a real mindset of resilience, and not courage necessarily, but sort of getting getting being being okay with it after a while. You know, again, like that mindset for me has been quite important, like becoming quite resilient. And being a really kind of comfortable sitting in the ambiguity for a bit in the first, I wouldn't even say six months because in a startup world, six months is like a lifetime. By then, they expect me to have revolutionized the PL, but certainly the first three months. Um, you're kind of really, you're like, especially if you're working for a small business, you're like, you're kind of like a swan, right? I mean, the analogy for me, I always take or an iceberg. <laughs> you, you seem to be absolutely in control in the surface. But you're pedaling and you're absolutely not knowing where you're going. Um, and you need to become comfortable with that. And that really, again, I think for me has been a, a big mindset shift is that resilience, that sort of being able to really be quite comfortable with, I don't know everything. It's you know the, all of the change and the unknowns and and the and the stress of it, but kind of going it's going to be okay and you know trusting it and and and, and still going for it. I think has been quite a big a big thing for me toward towards that path. I suppose. Um, yeah, that would be really the main things. I suppose the last thing I'd say is that we'll talk about it on the kind of leadership qualities, but I do also think that um, along I I do believe quite strongly around humility as well. Um, I think um, when you get to a CMO role, um, it gets to a point, especially if you're changing industries or jobs or roles, or it's like a, it's your first gig as a CMO, so it's new and it's quite daunting. I do think you do need to also accept or surround yourself and accept that other people will know, will be more, far more experts in their field than you ever will be because people might have spent 15 years doing CRM. And so really surrounding yourself with experts and being quite humble enough to go, my role is probably broad and other people will be, and I'm going to have have the best experts around me and they're going to really help me um you know kind of shine collectively as a team and, and succeed i think for me that's been a big realization as well that really importance of being quite humble to realize you know i'm, I'm not the expert in this you're much more than me you tell me how we should do this and i've only really recently in the last few years kind of become quite comfortable with that as opposed to i should know everything so for me that's been a big thing i think as well um so. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, the 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 first word that you, the first word that came into my head as soon as <clears throat> Elliot Elodie posed the question was resilience, and then you touched on it. But I think, um, and I totally agree. But I I would say that I only kind of consciously would call it resilience when I was probably at Perna Ricard and 
and almost leaving Pernod Ricard. So that would have been like 14 years into my career that I would have like termed it, oh, this is what resilience building mm -hmm. is. And then I look back and all of those things were resilience building. So I don't, I, I don't think, <clears throat> I certainly remember when I was like first starting out, I was a massive introvert and I needed to learn. I, I had to learn learned extroversion in order to succeed. Um, I think that was my first biggest lesson uh, was how getting yourself noticed if, if you're an introvert um, because I was passed up for promotion. So there, it's a good story, really. Like, so two, two junior product managers pretty much join at the same time, both massively into gaming. Uh, I, I went to a polytechnic and, and or, or in ex polytechnic and was a university, Bournemouth University and studied advertising marketing. He went to Oxford and did English. He was very extroverted. I was very introverted, but I knew advertising and marketing. And when it came to the promotions after six months, we'd, we'd done kind of almost the same things and, and promoted three or four games, but he'd been better at uh, asserting himself and, and promoting the fact that he'd done this, whereas I hadn't, and I was passed up for promotion. And at that point, I said I'd never let myself be passed up for promotion again, and I learned those skills that I needed to do that. So I think the, the kind of biggest lesson that I've had, aside from resilience, and that's kind of more of a thing looking back, is like what, what if you... As long as you focus on what's the learning here so i didn't get promoted but what's the learning okay i need to work on this um uh so yeah for me it's almost like if i always face a difficult situation or it's something that I feel really uncomfortable i say like well what's the learning here as long as you're learning something and you don't make the same mistake again uh then i think you're always going to be 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 moving forward yeah beautiful it's so true and when we were talking about you know changing industries like which seems to be a very important topic in in the field of marketing how did you did you make that choice um consciously to change the industry i think adam you mentioned earlier right you had some peers who went from nintendo to sega and that's what they were doing repeating the same thing but for you was this a conscious choice to change the industry and how did you make that choice um if 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 that happened or was it or was it just it just happened and you were really interested in those kind of industries i think yeah that's that's the weird thing is like i always thought about it as i just wanted to work on cool brands that were cool lifestyle brands that um fitted my life stage at that time and that maybe sadly my friends would think was cool as well yeah. so you know landing a role at playstation i was like right well what's the next brand that's really going to be cool and fit with my lifestyle it's like well, I love cocktail culture and I studied absolute vodka at university. So this absolute role sounds amazing. I'll go for that. And so it wasn't a conscious decision to say, I definitely want to go from gaming into drinks into a kind of like not for profit. It was just what was what was right for me at the time, what fitted kind of I almost wanted to build a portfolio of brands that I'd worked on. Right. I think that's what every marketer does. You want to you want to take your marketing skills and apply it to different brands. And if that brand just so happens to be in the drinks industry that has a different code of conduct, that is FMCG versus not for profit, which is more around governance and all those kind of structures, then then so be it. So it wasn't a conscious decision to change industries. It was a conscious decision to work on great brands that I admired and wanted to put my uh, make my mark on. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. And you, Virginie, what do you what do you think of that? I mean, I, I think um, no, it wasn't a conscious decision. I mean, I think I'm it's slightly different. <laughs> Making me laugh because when Adam was saying that, is like I took the reverse approach. I decided to go and work for brands that are not cool. So you know, just just to you know, just let's work for brands that no one <laughs> no one likes. Though, just joking, but <laughs> I suppose I'm, I ended up working for um, Insurance and Aviva, and it's not particularly a, a cool sector. Uh, so there was probably something there. I was like, oh, let's just let's just go for brands that are not cool. But I think um, I wasn't brand driven. Um, I think for me it wasn't, but it wasn't very conscious. I didn't sort of actively seek it out. What happened, and and it has been true to my career throughout and my choices. And sometimes again, it's it's paid off, and sometimes it hasn't. Is that I get um, for me the the thing that really matters the most is sort of a connection, almost meeting of minds with. Uh, with the founder or the MD or I mean it's that vision and do I believe in the vision of the company or not and um, if I get very excited by what the company is trying to do whatever the, the size actually of the company or the brand and also I believe that you know 
I, I, I can really add value. This whole, I can see my space in there. I can see what I can add. Then the industry doesn't really matter within reason. I've got my limits, but it, it, it doesn't really matter. What I get excited about is the potential, what I can bring and how the, I could really help change the norm, you know, challenge the status quo or do something different. And that is exactly what happened when I went to work for, from O2, I went to work for News UK. And at the time they were trying to develop their subscription business and I was really excited. And the CMO at the time who was working to, she was extremely, um, she was a, a very inspiring lady and I got expired in the interview and it got really, got re me really excited. And the same thing happened when I, I, I did interviews, they approached me for Viva, had some interviews and loved the vision, like what they're trying to do. And they, they, they wanted someone with my experience. And, and, and so I think that's exactly how, how I've kind of built and went on to work for other brands. And it was always almost with that sort of spark. It's I have the conversation, do I have a spark? Is there a passion? Is there something there? Or do I, yeah, do I feel like this might be, you know, not not for me or not or kind of the same thing I've done before. So I think that's been kind of a big, a big part of what has driven. And I said by doing that, I wouldn't say again it's always uh, the right thing to do. Um, so when I over COVID, I, I went went to work for a couple of startups, and um, one of them uh, that that Adam would know because we were talking about it. Uh, we were working with Ecology actually called Climate, and we ended up it ended up not work, not working out, and and the company are having to sell and and fail. Um, and I loved the vision. I got passionate about it, but you know, obviously, um, actually the the company wasn't doing very well. So um, it's not always, you know, it's not necessarily always successful, but it does drive a little bit of my considerations um, on how I, I kind of stumble on industries really. Um, yeah. So it's, it's slightly different. I'm not so much brand driven necessarily, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, good, good to know. And it's great that you mentioned, uh, you know, your skills and portfolio, right? Uh, building different skill portfolio uh, along your career and skills. You've mentioned that. And I've got a couple of questions here in the chat, which are talking about corporate or agencies. So I guess this applies the same, right? When you're, I mean, I've never worked in marketing for agencies. It's always going to be in the corporate side, right? So, but I don't know if you, if one of you have done that switch from either, you know, corporate to agency or vice versa and if you can tell us more about it and how was that transition for you i can go first if you want. Um, uh, adam yeah yeah go ahead <clears throat> i think ironically uh our i was on my uh, my degree was at advertising and marketing and all of my experience up until that point so since the age of 15 like every summer i would do internships at like advertising agencies like amv and tbwa and uh or well, as many as i could kind of like harass on the phone which was a skill that my dad taught me i hated this is this is pre-email anything you had to phone up send a letter maybe even send a fax and speak to the hr department to get your kind of internship so i would do like two weeks every summer uh in ad agencies and then when i did my degree it was expected that you'd also do kind of placements in ad agencies and i did a placement in uh gray advertising mm -hmm. in, in new york for two months um but then when it actually came to coming out the other side of university, um, I would say that 90, probably 99, probably 98 percent of everyone that graduated either went into a media agency or some went into ad agencies. But I would say majority went to media agencies or comms agencies. Um, and there were only like a handful of us, myself included, that went client side. Um, and I think, you know, agencies obviously give you breadth and depth of many different accounts that you'll be working on. Um, but the reason why I chose client side is because I wanted control of all of the levers. I didn't just want control of the, um, uh, just the kind of creative, which at that time was kind of, yeah, more with agency and, 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 and me, I wanted creative, I wanted media, I wanted digital, I wanted to be able to build websites. I wanted to be able to speak to the sales team, the customer success team, customer experience to see how it all looped up as part of one marketing plan rather than just having a chunk of it. And obviously it depends if you work in an integrated agency, you're probably going to see all of that, but from the agency side as well. So you would still get that and across multiple accounts. And therefore I think the path was a lot of the time you've either been in client side for a long time and then you go into agency at a very senior position, or you've been in agencies for a long time and then you go into a client side at, at a senior position, but you don't really kind of go 
between the two along the way it's kind of well certainly from all the people i know that made the jump both ways it's definitely been like maybe at least five years into a career that they may have made the jump either way um So I've had a very similar um, experience, actually, but um, I didn't work. I never worked for agency. But I worked as a consultant. I, I, I mentioned at the start, and actually, similarly, it, it's quite interesting because obviously we're talking to people who might be um, on the the graduate programs or the master's degrees. So I did an MBA. I did a business school in France, one of the top ones. Did an MBA, so full marketing, actually the full MBA. So, and. Um, and it's interesting because I'm also, I'm, we might talk about it later, but coming out of that, it kind of left me being a bit of a generalist. <laughs> so a same thing when you did an MBA coming from business school, the, the kind of pathway for a lot of people was agency or consulting side um, as a starting in your career because you're such a generalist you did your your kind of internships in in, in consulting strategic consultancies actually at the time that was the sort of grail to kind of holy grail to get to that's what everyone wanted to do and you were so generalist you end up a lot of them ended up consultants or, or agency side so exactly like you've had Adam and I think there was a the nature of it was just a path so I did like everyone else <laughs> strategic consultancy internships then rolled into um, a consultant so, so, so marketing consultant for Deloitte and then for Ernst and Young and um, and I think slightly different to maybe yourself Adam and what you were saying I didn't wait until I was senior enough or five years to make the move uh, because I about after two years in I absolutely realized this was not for me um, at all. I mean, the whole, it was really not for me, the pitching, the whole thing, the commercial aspect. And I really wanted to be client side for the same reason as you, Adam, like the frustration of not having all the levers. So what I did instead, and, it, and it's hard and um, it does take a while. And I remember looking for quite some time is that I identified roles where they need, they were advertising were looking for ex consultants or people with consulting type skills and it did mean going, that's why I talk about squiggly career, going in client side through a role that wasn't my ideal role or where probably I wanted to do my career. So I started as a planning manager, leading marketing planning and go to market, um, well, actually marketing planning for B2B for Orange UK. So I wasn't B2B at all. I was actually B2C. And I'm not sure I wanted to do marketing planning, but it was perfect. They needed someone with consulting skills. That's exactly what they needed. And they loved my profile for it. And that's how I got in. And then quite quickly, I actually moved to the consumer side and then I got to the brand side and I, I tried to make my way closer to what I wanted to do. Um, but that has been my experience is, is trying to find, yeah, trying to find replicable skills and, and they are. And I know actually even in my current role at the moment, current job, we are looking and we're looking for a particular role that we need to fill in. And for that role, we're looking for someone who has X agency, X consultancy experience because that role is specifically needing that so there are some roles like that they do think uh, kind of create give you that sort of crossover crossover but they are not that many and 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 sometimes also it's accepting that you might then have to compromise on this is not quite what i would like to do if you come from um a brand or creative agency and you then become marketing planning it might be a bit you know i'm not doing the big campaigns anymore but it's about finding out what you really want is if that's the top priority you really want to make that move and that's what i wanted to do i took that and i probably took i took a salary cut as well i mean it was yeah you, you, I, I definitely compromised um but then as you say adam the other path is to wait until you're senior enough and then there is probably another opportunity at that point yeah yeah, and talking about skanks, thank you, Virginie, for that as well. It's really um, insightful as well, for, I'm sure, for for listener today. Uh, those questions are going <laughs> through the roof. So, um, and in terms of talking about skills and qualities, so as as CMOs, what qualities or skills do you believe it's really essential for effective leadership, right, to get into that leadership role? And maybe it's some of those qualities that you or skills that you've developed over time and how or maybe transferable skills that helped you to transition from industries can you tell, can you tell us more about that maybe we'll start with adam um i i think i know it's, it, it's kind of people mention this all the time but i think storytelling is really important um but not just the story not just like storytelling uh <clears throat> externally about your brand and that kind of piece but actually 
how, what kind of story is, is emerging internally. So I always remember um, at Pana Ricard, like delving into the data, looking at what's happening in the marketplace and telling the story of uh, what is happening in your industry and how your brand is operating within that story. Um, and I always remember my marketing director, and this is what I do now for all of my presentations is if you can read the headline of a 20 slide deck of every single slide, just only if that kind of tells the most compelling story without needing to read anything that's on the slides, then I think that is, so the question was a skill, right? On skills within. Yeah. I think that that is that is one of the biggest skills that you can you can learn to do because otherwise I remember even like doing presentations to get job applications I started off doing you know the classic powerpoint here's loads of bullet points rule of 3 all that kind of stuff but actually in my kind of later pitches and then also subsequently when you were doing presentations internally it would be about really core visual big headline what's the story get people excited and then present the PL at the end, which if you're a finance director or a CFO, they're going to flick through to the end page anyway and look at your PL before you've even presented any of your strategy. Um, but yeah, I think that's the biggest skill is, is storytelling and bringing people on the journey. Um, and even to get to that point, you'll have had to have brought people on the journey to construct that story because you'll be asking the research people, you'll be asking the product development people, you'll be asking the impact team the innovation team to feed into that so you can't tell that story without the other key players within that story um so yeah i think bringing people along the journey and, and being a great storyteller is what i found is impactful great qualities to have what, what would you say virginie on that side um so i agree i agree actually building on 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 what adam was saying it was it was um he was bringing up lots of thoughts <laughs> one for another time <laughs> Gosh, probably one for another event <laughs> on the future tenure of marketeers and CMOs. Adam is probably nodding. Um, this is a, something that's going around a lot, the conversation around the, the CMOs having such a short tenure in the boardroom versus all the other C-suite members. And part of it is because marketing um, and CMOs, and it's linked to storytelling. And what I'm getting to is that um, most of the time, my experience, you, you get to a point, you get to a company and you have to do a lot of education around around marketing and it does go by storytelling so you might be an excellent marketeer at heart with 40 years experience and all the technical skills but what makes a difference in the skill of a cmo and probably your tenure being more than six months in the role is that you're able to sell it to others who do not understand a thing about marketing really the technicalities and therefore, we'll either see it as a cost center, we'll think it's super easy and everyone can do marketing, we'll think they have the answer. Choose your option. Each of all of these, all of all of the above answers could be true. And 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 actually the the, the really successful CMOs in my mind, even not so much myself, but even just looking at the ones who have really sort of had an impact on my career, were the ones who were amazing at that storytelling and that you know that being able to bring people on the journey of marketing of you know uh, the, the, yeah the value of marketing what we do you know what we bring to the business etc so I, I i wholeheartedly agree with that and where you fail is as if i see a mo you're coming coming in going i'm the expert i'm not going to be able to explain to you what i do it's a dark art but trust me and usually that doesn't work very well <laughs> um so that's definitely one thing um i think the other thing for me touching on what we talked about before i do feel like my my initial training as a business major and an MBA and, and it has kind of really come to fruition coming in, in terms of my career later on when I became senior in marketing. Um, because as I found out when you come become director of marketing and CMO is that the role of CMO and you will talk, probably talk about it depending on the industries. It's very broad. It's not just about marketing. <laughs> and actually, as a, as a CMO, you really need to be quite tech savvy, especially these days. You need, really need to understand tech. You need to understand tech because all your tools you're using are technology led. All the algorithms of the channels that you use are 
pretty techy heavy actually and really hard chat gpt so you need to be quite good at tech you can't just be a luddite i don't understand any of that stuff TikTok never never looked at it you kind of do need to be able to evolve and be technology savvy you also need to be quite commercial you need to really understand finance you can't just come in and i don't understand anything about pnl and so i find that that's where you know having had that training up front and having a really strong notion of other areas and that broad, for me, that's a really important skill when you get to CMO, you actually, and again, I think, you know, probably the, out of all the C-suite, the CMO is the one that is probably the broader skill set. Um, and again, I, I don't know why, but you are sort of borderline the commercial director, you, you yeah, you, you kind of tend to touch on sales, you touch on lots of things, and you need to really understand all of that, you know, you'll be working with product and you can't ask them constantly what a sprint is and so i think that's another thing i've wrote i wrote down because i found that to be really a core skill of a cmo and a bit of an expectation um and the last thing i'd say is that um interestingly for cmos the ones are really good is about applying ap applying your expertise on branding to your to yourself so being really good at personal branding and i think adam talked about it before but um, when you talked about becoming a, a an extrovert, it reminded me that um, you need to be quite good. Yeah, you need to be quite good at your own personal branding, communication, um, and you're kind of expected to be. That's the problem. Is that it's a skill that as a CMO, because you come from that world, people expect you to also be really good at it. <laughs> so Adam, that's why you said you had to learn it because if you're not naturally, you kind of have to learn. It's a skill you need to develop as a CMO. I feel. Um, yeah, because people yeah. expect that to be, yeah. Yeah, so thank you, Jenny. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's really it's all on point. It's all it's 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 all super interesting, and I think the audience is is pretty much like taking note. And I I do have a question for you, Virginie, in particular. Um, uh, one of the of the of the of the question in the chat is about you know if if you faced any challenge as a woman in a leadership position and on your journey to CMO, and how did you overcome that? <laughs> that will be another event altogether. Um, <laughs> we could spend quite a few um, a few hours on it. I mean, yes, I, I have. I suppose I'm, the reason I'm I'm pausing, and hesitating is I don't know if it's I don't know if the challenge as a woman was um, linked to the role of CMO and uh, wanting to progress in my career um, in that role and and to kind of get to that position versus it, because I probably didn't help myself where I also picked the worst industries. <laughs> I mean, the, I, I picked industries that are kind of notoriously probably not easy for women and, and obviously things are, are improving. But back in the days, um, these would be industries where it wouldn't be you didn't have very diverse um, uh, C-suites and, and boards, boardrooms. So, um, you know, financial sector, insurance, even um, even. Um, uh, sort of uh, media, um, so traditional newspapers were, were quite traditional. So, so certainly, yes, as, as a woman in these industries, it's a little bit difficult because of the historical culture and values. I don't know if it's because of the industry or because of me trying to progress. I wouldn't be able to, to really say. I suppose the one thing I, that I really has kind of struck with me a little bit um, around that question and said I, I I won't go too deep in it because there will be a, there would be a lot to unpick um, and I could go into a lot of it and yes I I have faced some challenges um, I mean it might it might help for people to know I you know yeah I had some major setbacks around when I had my I have two children and both times I was made redundant I love talking about the story people look horrified I've kind of recovered from it but it is uh, quite a bad I've unfortunately been quite impacted by it um mm -hmm. so I was in industries where where unfortunately yes um, the fact that I was pregnant and then had to go on maternity leave uh, was kind of held against me a little bit so I was quite heavily impacted at that point the only thing that I also struck something that really resonated with me quite recently is because of that I got to a point where I think more as a woman than than maybe maybe not I got to a point where I was getting quite I was quite used to being quite tough I sort of built a bit of a tough exterior I thought you know you need to really blend in especially as they uh, having been made redundant having had two pregnancies and children it sounded like people were not open to me having maybe of a personal side and then I got to my last role actually before my current one 
And I think I got really quite tough as a person. And it wasn't really me. Um, I'm quite a people person. And I know some, my team are listening in, so I hope they'll, they'll um, agree. I tend to be quite quite nice, actually, and gentle. And, but that was getting quite tough. And actually, in that last role, I got a really a bit of an, an, a reckoning, an eye-opening, because I got some feedback three months in where um, I got told, you know, you, you, need to let, you need to loosen up. You need to soften up. You need to soften the edges. You're you're putting a facade, and it's all great. Technically, you're great, but it's you're not. Yeah, it's it's just not connecting with the teams. And it was really interesting because I think that's another skill I think for CMOs is that you do need to be a little bit authentic as well. I do think it's important that you kind of bring yourself. Um, and it was, it's linked, I suppose, because I think as a woman, I did it quite consciously. I was thinking, oh, you know, I look, I'm already a mom, and if I already look soft, this is all going to go against me. So let me just be really tough at work. And it really um, ended up quite impacting, you know, not, a, you know, but they did say, you know, you, yeah, you kind of need to, you need to, we need to show, you need to show that CMO leadership side of you, and you're, you're being a bit, you, yeah, it's, it's not coming through. And it was a big thing for me. A really, really good piece of feedback. It really defined quite a bit for me. I, I took that seriously, and then since then, I've really, you know, yeah. So that's, I don't know. Hopefully, that yeah, no, helpful. that's yeah, that's really good. That's and thank you for your authenticity just now, right? And uh, this is a leadership skill in itself, right? To be authentic, to lead authentically as a leader. So, so and it's not easy. So whether you're a man or a woman, right? So, um, and actually, Adam talking about roadblocks, talking about, you know, um, challenges, I, I, I'd love to ask you the same question, like what kind of roadblocks or challenges have you have you experienced in your career to get to where you are today? So that probably can help you some of our attendees here today to see I don't know. I, I guess everybody needs to go through their own challenges, right, and deal with them in different ways. But I think it's always good to hear from from professionals such as you to to see how you've overcome some of those. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I'd say that the, my my current role, uh, you know, as CMO, has been yeah, it's been a huge challenge and many roadblocks. Let's say example is you know I did consultancy six months before <clears throat> I actually got the full time role. And then three months into. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> I think we've lost Adam. <laughs> oh, uh, he's back. I'm back. <laughs> okay. Not sure where, what happened there. <laughs> I don't uh, know. So weird. Uh, so, uh, so, and three months into the role, the business decided it was going to pivot fully to B2B. And I'm not a B2B marketeer. Uh, and so suddenly uh, I was asked, being asked to almost relearn marketing within the space of three to six months to see if, you know, I could kind of cut it. And, um, you know, there's lots and lots of similarities. I know I've already answered one of the questions, but there's lots of similarities between B2C and B2B marketing and actually the, the best of B2C in terms of long-term brand building, short-term sale activation, the long and short of it, all that kind of stuff really, really does ring true. But you've also got to prove that, you know, the kind of real B2B engine, which is, you know, well, the, the new thing, you know, the old thing was like lead generation. The new thing is demand generation, which is taken out of the B2C playbook, which is like building great brand that hits emotionally and then demand capture, making sure that your SEO, making sure that your lead forms, making sure your CRO, making sure your CRM passing leads to the sales teams and automating that out the other side of the funnel. And, you know, I now talk in terms of like, what's the lifetime value of the consumer? What's the total LTV GP? What's the total value? you know, the weighted pipeline, but this is all stuff that I had to learn super quickly um, over the course. So th the first thing I did was I bought some books on B2B marketing, you know, even as a CMO, it, you're always learning, right? So I bought the one from the head of PwC. I also bought one from Mark Chuecki, who was um, the editor in Marketing Week, read his book and actually his book really resonated with me. And then my CEO uh, actually said, oh, you know, uh, I think I, I know someone who knows Mark. Uh, would you like me to put you in touch with him? So I said, absolutely. And then Mark actually then ended up becoming my mentor from a B2B marketing point of view to say, look, this is the go to market. This is the playbook that I'm doing. Can you have a look at it for me and check that this is kind of what you would do? And I can just use him as a sounding board. So I guess you've just, you know, that was the biggest challenge is you, I had to become a complete learner again, even at the age of 45 and in a CMO role, learning what I thought I'd, I'd already learned my craft. 
and I could apply it, but I had to learn a whole new new set of skills. And actually, I'm a better marketeer for it now. And now I've got B2B uh, as a string to my bow. And, and actually, you know, when you think about it, economic downturn, consumers are spending less. Actually, B2B is where more money is and where more businesses can spend. Even in an economic downturn, businesses are still going to spend more money. So I think, you know, B2B could be like the next generation of kind of marketeers. And actually, you'll start to see some a lot of B2B brands become a lot more, quote unquote, sexy because, you know, consumer marketeers may be coming into that as, as part of it. So, uh, yeah, that was certainly the biggest challenge and continues to be. But I've come out the other side and I actually now really love the craft of B2B. It's like even more technically interesting than, than consumer marketing, I think now. So. Thank you, Adam. And actually, talking about books and resources, you've talked about books. The book from Mark. Would you have a, a name of that book, or not really? Yeah. Uh, do you know what? I've actually got it on my desk. The two <laughs> ones. In fact, there are three great books here. There you go. Uh, there go. Uh, from boring to brave. Boring to brave. Here we go. Mark, uh, Transforming the B two B buyer journey by Antonia Wade, who's from PwC. And then this one, which I thought was a really good book. Uh, it's by a woman called Alice de Corsi, who started life in a startup and actually recorded all of her um, journey on LinkedIn posts. And so this whole book is all the LinkedIn posts that she wrote turned into a story and then published. And actually, you know, it's the perfect lead gen material because it's actually got me to go and visit the site, sign up to Cognizant and we may be using them. So, again, like... Uh, I also used a lot of these as experiments to see like how were they affecting me in terms of like attracting me as a B2B buyer. Um, so yeah, those are, those are the three books. That look good. Perfect. And, 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 and do you, Virginia, do you have any um, resources that uh, you could share for? Or... Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So I also second the uh, life of CMO. I know that book as well. I've read it. So actually that's why I was nodding. Um, yeah, I was recommended. I can't remember when. It must be quite popular now because it's going around. Um, so I absolutely second that. Is I love the format as well. Um, part of part of my sort of I don't know. One of my resolutions this year was to build more of my profile on LinkedIn and reading how she had recorded all those posts and things. I thought was was amazing, very inspiring. Um, I suppose I'm, I, I, it's quite interesting because I was thinking about this because you always get asked your resource. Uh, it's a bit of a question. And I'm a bit, um, I'm a bit unusual, um, I think, in that sense, um, where I, because again, I, I said I'm a mum of two very young children, so I don't get much time to read. And so I have to say that, well, before in the start of my career, I probably read lots of books and the usual books and uh, habits of affected people and all that sort of stuff. Lately, I haven't had much time to read or even do a podcast or anything, but I do have inspiration and I do have some resources that I used a lot to learn and build. Um, some of them were, and some of so some of them are a little bit unusual, different, so not so much books, but um, I've used a number of ways. So um, I suppose one of the things I've done um, and um, and I've used up up until now is that I've had and I've had the well I've had the well I had a big business coach so I actually used a coach and I've I've been coached for several times in my career where I used even privately paid for for coach and business coaches which has helped me enormously and again this is because I was thinking about, you know, you can learn lots of things from others in books and all their words of wisdom. But I do myself learn a lot just by doing. I'm someone who learns on, on, on by doing. And so I think the best times I learn is when I'm put in a situation and it's a little, little bit like you've done, Adam. It's a real life problem. And then I have to go and learn about it. I don't learn very well if I just read a book. Um, I'm just not like that. And so typically with a coach, the thing that is quite nice is that it has, it makes you work on yourself and come up with the answers yourself. And it has helped me immensely. I'm now training to be a coach myself because I loved it so much. And I really see the impact on others. Um, you kind of find answers, you find solutions and steps yourself. So that's another one way I've used it. I've also been very fortunate to have mentors. So people in the industry who are much higher up and gave me their time and gave me lots of resource, lots of feedback, lots of advice. So rather than having to read the book, I was just meeting with them. <laughs> so, um, so that was one way I've done it as well. I've, I've, I've seeked some mentors throughout my career. Um, and then I suppose I was on the marketing academy once, so I signed up for that and, and that was really helpful. That was a full program to really, again, another type of resource to really learn practically. Um, 
And then um, the other thing I've done a lot lately is I've I've used LinkedIn and the power of LinkedIn a lot. So I've I, I use it a lot. Um, there's a lot of great resource there, blog posts, LinkedIn kind of courses, people putting viewpoints, um, and I do learn every day a lot through um, others. And 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 so that's almost my my own book, right? I, I use that a lot. So that would be kind of my 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 probably my main ways. I'm. Now I've also signed, I'm part of, um, I've also developed my network. And again, this is something I could encourage people to do. So through net mentoring, I'm myself a mentor now, and I'm part of two um, mentoring groups who are from women. And mm -hmm. these groups are an enormous re um, pool of resource. So we do events, conferences, we do lots of things. And um, it helps a lot, again, learn and develop. Um, I'm also part of a CMO um, sort of network group, and we also share lots of tips there. So I think I've done a lot of the learning, maybe less out of the books, but uh, but yeah, that's kind of all my sources. <laughs> yeah, beautiful, and, and it's great. It's great it's advice. Fun. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Uh, short on time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. So we've we've answered a couple of questions as we were going along, so it's perfect. And uh, and for those questions we haven't answered, we'll 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 reach out. Uh, We'll type the answer or something. And I'm happy to put the names of the network mentoring groups, by the way, as well. Um, they're yeah. not in any way secret. People can apply. They have like um, cohorts you can apply to. And so people are interested. I can put the names and they can apply and get themselves a, a mentor. And yeah, so it, I think that would so. be fantastic to do that. Yeah, yeah. If you can write it in the chat or or just send it over to us and we'll send an email or uh, so people can find that resource. That would be great. So to end this uh, this fireside side chat, uh, what what would be the last word, like the advice or guidance that you would offer um, to or attendees? Uh, you know who are aiming to become a CMO, maybe in the future, uh, based on your own journey? What would be the last one advice? <laughs> My last piece of advice would be... Oh, I was trying to unmute. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, I would just don't, don't chase the title. Um, that said, you know, I've had a very linear career, right? junior product manager, product manager, senior product manager, marketing manager, head of marketing, brand director, CMO. But, uh, we, you know, Virginie and I were talking, it doesn't end at CMO. And if I was to go into um, Unilever tomorrow, I would definitely not be a CMO. I might be a senior director or I might be a VP of marketing there, um, in which case some people would say, oh, no, he's taking a step down. He used to be a CMO. So it really just depends on the context and the type of company you're in. Um, but I think in terms of like startups where, where Virginie and I have done quite a lot most recently, you can grow super quickly. You can get promoted super quickly and you get, I'd say, you know, twice as much experience in half the amount of time as you will do anywhere else. So I know that maybe doesn't answer the question, but yeah, don't chase the title. Just chase, chase what you are interested in that fits what you want to do at that particular point in time and the rest will follow. Beautiful. Thank you for that, Adam. What about you, Virginie? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree. I think, um, I suppose I'd add, um, for, for me, it, it would probably be, you know, what we talked about before. Um, the, the one thing that kind of sticks is to, um, you know, to kind of, authenticity is really, really key. Um, and, you can you can learn things. You can learn to become extrovert if you're introvert because you need to for a particular role. But but I think it is really really key um, to um, yeah to kind of be quite authentic and bring yourself as you are to to work and to to kind of um, the, 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 I suppose how you interact with people. Um, I think. Um, that's for me is something that I said has stuck with me a lot is, is the, yeah, is, is kind of really being authentic. The other thing we touch on it br only briefly, but um, I do think that 
in hindsight is a beautiful thing. <laughs> so um, Adam mentioned it, you don't, when you're going through the start of your career and it's a bit rocky and it's a bit hard, you don't really think, oh, I'm being resilient. You tend to think about it afterwards when you reflect back. So I think you're kind of thinking this is hard or I'm, oh, I'm not doing well or whatever. However, I do think, I mean, if we're talking words of wisdom of people who might have gone to CMO at one point, is that the, you learn twice as much from your failures when it doesn't work, then it works. I mean, it, you really do. Like if things don't work, and I wouldn't even call them failures, but if things at some point don't work, if you get setbacks, you do, um, you, you know, it's it's good to em try and embrace them. You do learn a lot. You do learn twice as much, actually. So there's a real opportunity to, to progress from these. Um, even if at the time, again, you probably don't see them as, oh, this is, you would never, you know, something doesn't go well or you get made redundant or whatever, you're never going to go in and the next day and go, ooh, this is an opportunity to learn. Ooh, I'm going to embrace this. But it's, it's a, it, it, there, it is something true, though, that it will probably lead to a learning and to some growth um, because you, you do, they do make you progress quicker, actually. You do learn a lot from them. So, I mean, it's hard to say embrace them, but, but there is real something about finding that, surrounding those kind of pockets of opportunities when things also are not going um, as, as planned. So it's, it's yeah, it's not always going to go to plan. I mean, some people do. Some people have very yeah. uh, linear careers, but um, if it doesn't, um, I think, yeah. <laughs> it's a bad perspective, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very hard to get, but yes, yeah. yeah. No, well, thank you for that, Virginie. Yeah, thank you. So thank you both. I think this has been really helpful. Uh, and, uh, and I think we've answered most of the question in the chat. Uh, thank you also, Adam, for answering a couple of them as well. So perfect. Uh, um, I think that's it. I think we're done. And uh, thank you both of you for all of your knowledge sharing. And I hope that was uh, really insightful for the attendees. And we look forward to seeing you next. I'm going to, Aizel, would you, would you close this or shall I close it? Not sure. But anyway, I wish you... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm happy to close it. I, I just to share my screen. I want to thank everybody. That was really, really interesting. I'm thinking of ditching alumni relations and moving into marketing. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Any questions we've not answered, we will follow up with these guys and maybe put an email, a list of the books, if the mentoring, and anything, Adam and Virginie, that you think, oh my God, I forgot to mention, just let us know and we'll put it in the email as well. And I want to thank everybody for attending and we'll hopefully see you next time. See you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Bye.